power comes from taking actions. Hello and welcome to the business of architecture. So here joined with the co-founder of business of architecture, Mr. Enoch Sears. Enoch, how are you? I'm doing excellent, Ryan. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So today we're going to jump straight into it and we're going to be talking about the culture of complaint that pervades so many architectural businesses today. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. I was intrigued by another business that's addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly, and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high-performing remote teams quickly and efficiently, saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near-native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement, and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. This is quite an interesting topic. We hear about it a lot from our own clients. We hear about it a lot from business owners, and normally it's a complaint about complaining. And I find it quite curious, if you like, um, but a very important conversation to have because I don't think people realize how in, how insidious it is complaining, how damaging it is to the business and how disempowering it is to the individuals working in the business, your performance, your money, your bottom line, the levels of stress. We talk about mental health in the architecture industry and, you know, this is going to be kind of fueled by a culture of complaint um, and it's rife. It's, it exists a lot in, in architecture practice. I think it's fueled a lot as well by the kind of injustice that exists in the architecture profession as well, in the sense that there's a lot of dis-ease and unhappiness about pay, working conditions, um, all these other issues from equality and diversity and et cetera, et cetera. Add it, add it to the list of, of stuff. Um, but there is this culture of complaining in the profession that is, it's, it's like a, it's like a lead weight. And yet, yeah, Ryan, talk to us a little bit about what do we mean by the culture of complaint? What do you mean when you say that? What will we be talking about today? So complaining are about just a loss of power, okay? So a, a culture of complaint might look like team members going off whinging about all sorts of things that they've got going on in there in, that's happening in the business, but not, not feeling empowered to be able to do anything about it. I think that's the distinction. It's fine to, to like vent and to have a kind of healthy space where people can talk you know, and we'll often encourage our clients, for example, to create safe spaces for people to be able to vent and complain and, you know, probe into what's working, what's not working in their organizations. But when it's unsaid communication, when it's lingering resentments, when it's um, complaining or resignation, when there's a complaint about, you know, continued complaining about planning authorities, about other people, 
about how it's too hard, it's too difficult, how this and this X, Y, Z doesn't work, how it's impossible. This is where it's, you know, and where, and where there is no conversation for being empowered around it, or there's no conversation to be able to help an individual um, look at their subjective experience and recognize how much of it is objectively true versus how much of how much suffering am I bringing to the circumstance or the environment? Okay, and that's that's quite that's a little bit more subtle and more nuanced and more difficult to uh, to to kind of observe, but good businesses can introduce that kind of self-awareness or training and coaching to have people become very self-aware of how, you know, just empowering them how to deal with a difficult circumstance and how for them to um, uncollapse their interpretation of the circumstances versus the re actual what has happened, the what so about the situation. And that's really what we're kind of talking about is, is that there are, challenging circumstances that are happening in, in every business and architecture is just it's a challenging profession and you're going to be dealing with difficult things and particularly when things go on site stuff doesn't work and things break and things get put in the wrong place and you're now dealing with lots of other people and they've got their own adrenaline and complaints and demands of you it's easy to become reactive and without a disciplined mental way of viewing this, these scenarios, um, it's easy to get carried away with disempowering interpretations of, of, of events. That's the, the kind of the key point here. It's disempowering interpretations which leave you without any ability to take action. That's it. That's it. It's, it's just it, because power comes from taking actions. So if... That I'll give you an example. So back when I was at the last firm that I worked for, which was eons ago, um, you know, it was a great firm. It was great. I got good pay. There was a lot of great things to say about it. However, at the time when I was working there, there were a lot of things that I was like, you know, I was kind of like, uh, that's not working the way it should. I don't like how the firm owner does this. Uh, he shouldn't talk to people like that. There was a lot of this happening in my head. This shouldn't happen this way. Oh, we should have charged this client more. We're operating inefficiently here, blah, 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 blah. So me seeing either real issues or perceived issues in the way the practice was operating. Okay. That's, that's the noticing. So there was the awareness of me seeing some things. And then there was a judgment interpretation about those where I was thinking, oh, I could do it better, or there's a better way to do it, et cetera. But the issue was, is that I never brought those issues up powerfully and expressed them to the firm owner in a constructive way. So then what ended up happening is I, I had a, a very, very small slice of resentment just walking around with this idea in my head that I knew things were better, but like this unsettled sense of mm, things aren't exactly as they should be. But here's the problem. I never expressed those. Well, number one, back then I didn't have the I didn't have the capability from a leadership perspective to be able to express those things to a powerful way to the firm leader so we could come to some sort of consensus. Now, contrast that with an email that I got just last week from an employee of an architectural practice. He reached out to us because he listens to the podcast. He can see in his practice that there's a lot of things that could be improved. And instead of just complaining about it, he sent us an email say, hey, Enoch, I'd love to get on the phone with you and talk about our practice. I said, are you a firm owner? He says, no, I'm an employee. I said, well, how about we do this? Why don't you you know, see if your see if the owners share your concerns, and if they do share your concerns, then invite them onto a call with me, and we can talk about it. Right. So he went back, had a powerful conversation. He came back. He said, "Yep, yeah, firm owners say they they agree with the concerns as well, and they're definitely interested in looking at ways to solve these problems and the issues." So, you know, contrast those to my the way that I was before, complaining, whinging, Ryan, as you would say, and uh, you know, lacking power to this young architect who's listening to our podcast who actually took action. So he wasn't just, he, he that turned that complaint or that unsettled feeling into an action that's then going to produce results, assuming they decide to get help for these issues. So that's, that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about lacking power is that when we're in a space of complaint, we lack the ability to make any changes because we kind of throw our hands up and say, say la vie, it's just what it is. It is what it is. I have no control here. I don't have any power here. I can't do anything. It's the firm owners, the only ones that decide that thing. But that's not powerful leadership. That's not, you know, what would the world be like if Martin Luther King 
had said that, oh, I don't have any power. There's nothing I can do here. What's a guy like me, a black preacher from the South? No one's going to listen to me. I have no impact here. What if Jesus would have said that? Oh, you know, who am I? Just this crazy fisherman, carpenter guy from Galilee. You know, I, I should probably just stay at home and become a carpenter. You know, we look at someone like Gandhi. What if Gandhi would have said, man, those Brits, they sure are powerful and strong. And who am I to to try to say anything? You know, I'm just I'm just a, a lowly Hindu practitioner, monk, I might as well just mind my own business, right? We would be, the, it goes without saying that the world would be worse off without these amazing people to do these things. So as a listener on the podcast, consider that if you, if you have complaints and you see things that need to be changed, this is good. They're, they're there for a reason. They're catalysts to cause you to change. That's what discomfort's for. That's why suffering, what are the causes of suffering? It's like when we're suffering, it moves us to action. It moves us to action. But if we're scared about conflicting with people, if we're scared about confrontation, if we want to always you know, make everyone feel good about us and we're not worried about a little bit of upset, then we'll never be able to rise in our power like we need to be to be able to make the impact that we're being called to have. And so the culture of complaint is giving up our power. It's giving up our agency. It's saying, oh, well, I have nothing to do in the matter. I might as well just, uh, I might as well just go eat worms. Nothing can be done here. And it's literally as powerful as that. It's as powerful as your, as your word. And if you say you haven't got any power in the matter, then you don't have any power in the matter. Well, That's, I've been there. That, yeah. that, that, is, that is the power of our word. You say that it can't be done and it can't be done. And this is the inquiry that people need to need to need to go through we had a a client recently and we do a whole kind of training on complaint and we call it a personal power leakage and you know we we refer to complaining as being one of the biggest and most disempowering things that we do as business owners and leaders that we don't realize that we're doing and we project our complaints onto the rest of the team. And if everyone is looking towards the top and the, the top is complaining, then you can guarantee that they're going to have permission to complain and that complaint will be one of the prevalent types of conversations that happen in the office. And before anything ever gets done or is considered doing, it will always be done with a background of complaint or a filter of complaint. Very, very disempowering toxic environments. So we had a client recently who you know, went through our complaining training and had a real awakening, if you like, and a kind of, you know, a very powerful awakening. And I think this takes uh, a lot of courage to do, to just be honest with where you are complaining. It takes a lot of self insight and diligence to own up to your complaint and to let go of it. Um, you know, and they went through our complaining training and they said at the end of it, they were like, wow, I just, our whole office is in complaint. And I never thought it was, I never thought it was complaint. I thought that we were, we were being valid, but it's everywhere. It's everywhere we look. It's the way that we deal with the, the planners. It's the way that we deal with each other. It's the way that we deal with our clients. There is always some kind of complaint happening in, in the office. And it's everywhere. And this person decided to show the training video to the rest of the team and for them to actually start an active conversation about it, which is slowly, slowly part and parcel of the first steps of just becoming aware of I'm complaining. I'm complaining Beautiful. here. We had Beautiful. another another client in the same in the same training, a husband and wife team, and the wife said that for two weeks after watching the complaining video, her husband did not complain in the business. And she said <laughs> her, her own personal experience of working in the company was completely transformed. Because, and, and husband and wife teams do this a lot as well. So husband and wives, you know, your intimate closest partner is often the person who you dump on the most. They're the ones who you come home from work and you're just like, Bleh. here's all the, here's all the shit that happened to me today. Here's all the things that went wrong in the office. And if you're working together, I can only imagine that that is intensified and that, you know, one person in the partnership can end up seeing the other as their sort of their dumping ground. 
you know, this is part and parcel of intimate relationships is that you get to see both the best and the worst of the person at the same time. But she was expressing how two weeks of non-complaint was literally life-changing. And uh, her whole attitude to wanting to go to work was changed. She felt opt optimistic, joyful. It was it was happy. And then some something happened, and then the complaining started again. And we did a little bit of coaching together, and uh, and they had a scenario where they were you know able to recount what happened, why did the why did the complaining come back, how were they able to powerfully deal with the complaints, or the or re frame what the situation was in a more powerful way that's really what it all it is it's it's reframing the paradigm reframing the situation or the circumstances and bringing new meaning to the situation which is much more empowering for everybody involved so that the background of complaint is not there just taking everyone's energy away and when it's not something beautiful starts to happen Possibility starts to enter into the into the space, just like Martin Luther King was able to change the narrative of the entire United States and the entire world. These kind of small changes can happen in your architectural practice, but only if we dive in with both feet, only if we actually are are, are open to the idea of taking responsibility. So, complaining uh, number one is is two things. Number one, seeing a problem, but number two, feeling like a victim in the matter. That's ultimately what it comes down to, and. Uh, okay, so another example here. We were talking to uh, just earlier today one of the clients uh, on on the call, and he was talking about his 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 big goals, and he was talking about how he'd love to have a Lamborghini, be able to drive from job sites to in his Lamborghini. Now, I'm I don't know how it's going to go getting on some unpaved roads on Lamborghini, but we didn't get that far. The point <laughs> is, is that he wants a Lamborghini. I, I salute that. I think that's amazing. I love fast cars myself. And then, but then he shared something really vulnerable. He said, "But you know, I'm worried about what my what my team members will think." You know, they'll think that I'm just lining my pockets with, you know, they're just working to make me money. And that was such an honest and powerful statement because I know that that thought has crossed every leader's mind. The leader in a business who's doing well is always thinking, oh, what are my employees going to think that I'm, you know, they're just working and slaving away to make me money. And on the architectural side, oftentimes this actually happens. So this is the narrative in a lot of employees' minds as we think, oh man, I'm working so hard and the firm owner's making all this money. Then we start to feel entitled. And again, we enter into complaint, the claim, complaint being that that firm owner should pay us more or they shouldn't be making that much money or whatever the narrative is. But again, this results in a loss of power. So Ryan, what do you suggest for firm owners that, that have this concern? Because I know, I know there's, if you're a firm owner listening to this right now, you're probably nodding your head saying, yep, I've I've heard about that myself. So there's a couple of ways. First of all, let's talk about how firm owners generally deal with this cognitive dissonance in their mind. One of the very common ways in architecture is to try to set up a flat egalitarian structure in the office whereby everyone is compensated fairly or everyone is given transparency into what other people, I mean, just all sorts of interesting, innovative strategies that ultimately go back to making the firm owner feel better about the fact that they're running a capitalistic business, meaning they're the steward of the money, right? And unfortunately, what we see a lot of times is a lot of these, not all of them, but some of these practices are misguided and actually counterproductive in terms of helping people to perform their best, helping people to feel a sense of purpose. If I had a dollar for every time a firm owner told me that I gave that employee a raise and their 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 behavior didn't change or like they gave them a raise because they were hoping to they were hoping to inspire them into higher levels of performance. It didn't happen. Now they're frustrated. They have an employee who's making more money. And not only did it did they not change their performance, it actually got worse. So well, it, this this is this is why psychology is one of the pillars of smart practice. You cannot overlook the fact that we are human beings and that we're our, we operate on our mindset and so much about a smooth running practice, so much about your path as a free architect relates to your psychology and the psychology of your team members. I think that's so interesting, The how the guilt about running a profit machine or a business pervades into the mind of the owner. They don't want to take money out. They don't want to pay themselves. They want to try and increase the the fees, the salaries of team members. Not that's, not that that's a bad thing. I, we're fully advocates for making sure that you pay people as highly as possible 
but we're also advocates that businesses make a lot of money and that you celebrate money and the making of money in your business and that there's a mature culture in the organization around that. What often happens is that people will complain, T team members will complain, they'll be disempowered about their salaries, they'll be disempowered and fueled by what they're reading and watching in on TikTok. Um, the career advice that exists generally in, in the profession at the moment is to do the, the kind of sidestep or the diagonal move. So after two years of being trained in or learning in one practice, jump on to another practice and you'll have an instant surge in, in salary and perhaps responsibility. Your title will probably change. And the problem with this advice is that it actually works. Right, so. uh, I've done it. I mean, every time I change firms, I got a substantial raise, and, and, and from so five to ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars. From the, from the employee perspective, it works, but they're never really free from their own complaint. Okay, and actually, it it, it requires complaint to kind of keep doing that jumping. And so, a good firm owner needs to be needs to be aware that that's what they're competing with, and that complaining is one of these catalysts that just makes that diagonal movement happen. So as a firm owner, we've got to be able to, to deal with that and create that kind of diagonal movement inside of your own firm and give the ability for team members to have surges or sudden increases in pay, which aren't just entitled or expected you know, raises at the end of the year or that ju don't just accrue just purely from the fact that you've been there for five years, okay, that there should be a, a much more structured system for getting entry to the next title. This should be something you should do. You've got to work for. There's ultimately the real reason why, you know, uh, how to increase your wage as, a, as an employee is to provide more value to the company. And that often might mean learning new, a new skill set learning leadership, learning to deal with people, learning how to delegate, learning how to deal with conflict, learning more technical skills. Okay, We see this huge void in architecture of people who just do not know how buildings are put together. Amazing, fantastic designers, creative, artistic, all that kind of stuff. But actually knowing details, construction details, construction science, there is a huge, huge void. So you know, for, for a practice owner to start structuring career growth and progression and clearly outline it and say, okay, so once you become an architect, the next step would be for you to become a project manager. And in order to become a project manager, you need to do X, Y, and Z. You need to have this amount of years experience on the job. And then there'll be a little, maybe a, either some sort of initiation or qualification process like you have to run a few projects at a certain level of profitability before you can wear the title of project manager. But rarely do I do we do we see that in, in business. I mean, when we're working with our clients and we're talking about making people partners, it becomes a much more sort of structured conversation. First of all, what are the what are the domains of competency that a partner needs to have? They've got to better win the work. They've got to better do the work. They've got to better understand the kind of support systems that are involved in in the work. Okay, great. Well, how do we train them and also test their competency before we suddenly give away a whole chunk of my business to them? Because we see that happening all the time. People give away, you know, ten twenty percent of their business out of fear of somebody leaving. And they've given their business away to somebody who has no interest in being a partner. They've got no interest in winning work. They've got no interest in support work. They just want to be a designer. They've got no interest in, in, the, in either leading or managing people. And when that happens, now we've got, now we've got a, a, a serious problem. Well, I mean, who does want to lead and manage people? Let's face it, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most firm owners don't, right? But that's that's neither here nor there. So, the the the, the possibility here is that you know leading leading your teams and people is it may not come naturally, and as a matter of fact, it doesn't to most people, right? This is why this is why senior executive, this is why leaders are constantly investing in their own leadership. They're investing in training. They're investing in project management training. They're investing in their people, which goes back to running a profitable business.
So top takeaways from today, here's the thing. We talked about a culture of complaint in architecture. This happens at the micro scale. It happens at the macro scale. It happens industry-wide where we have complaints about developers, contractors, planning authorities, like the, the economy. We have all sorts of complaints about that. And then we have complaints about our teams. We have complaints about our team members. We have complaints about our clients. We have, and the list goes on and on and on. So the question we want to invite you into today is where do you have a complaint? Uh, we want to we want to validate that complaint and say you're probably not you're probably complaining about that for a very very good reason. Now the question we'd like to have you consider is what's an action that you can take? How can you take ownership of this complaint? And what's something that you can actually do to move yourself towards a solution in this area? That's the way that a free architect thinks. Fantastic. And the last thing that I'll point towards is what you just said there, Enoch, about leadership doesn't come naturally but it is natural and that everybody has this natural leadership expression inside of them and us as the business owners that's part of our role is to make sure everyone expresses that and that's a wrap hey enix sears here and i i have a request since you are a listener here of the business of architecture podcast ryan and i we love putting this podcast together we love sharing information as much as we can glean from all the other industries that we're a part of to bring it back to empower you as an architect and a designer. And one thing that helps us in our mission is the growth of this podcast, simply because it helps other architects stand for more of their value, spreads the business information that we're sharing to empower architects together. So architects, designers, engineers can really step into their greatness whatever that looks like for each individual. And so here my, my simple ask is for you to join us and be part of our community by doing the following, heading over to iTunes and leaving a review of the podcast. And as an expression of our sincere thanks, we would like to give you a free CEU course that can get you one professional development unit, but more importantly, will give you a very solid and firm foundation on your journey to becoming a profitable and thriving architect. So here's the process for that. After you leave us a review, send an email to support at businessofarchitecture.com. Let us know the username that you use to leave the review and we will send you that free training. On the training, you'll discover what 99% of architecture firm owners wished they would have known 20 years ago. And the other 1%, well, they just didn't even know that they didn't know. Head over to iTunes and leave us a review now. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. I was intrigued by another business that's addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high-performing remote teams quickly and efficiently, saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near-native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.